And as we worship today, we're going to be looking at a new sermon series called Foundations. And I want to say a little bit about this sermon series before I read some scriptures and then talk about what God's Word is saying to us perhaps today. First of all, during this month, we're getting ready for the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. You know, this thing, the Reformation, it's all about Jesus, all about what God has done for us, all about the ways in which he demonstrated his love for us in Jesus, and how God's Word shows the way for that for us. And so during this month, we're doing a sermon series called Foundations. What are some of the foundational truths that all followers of Jesus are going to hold to and follow? And we built this sermon series on some things that, that grew out of the Reformation. Uh, there are three phrases that grew out of the Reformation that sometimes we refer to. So if you're an old school Christian Lutheran, you'll probably recognize it. Sometimes we call them the three solas. That is scripture alone, sola scriptura, grace alone, sola gratia, and by faith alone, sola fides. And those are three foundational principles for us as Christians that God uh, has redeemed us simply because of his grace, by his grace alone. We didn't add to it. Through faith, we come to know and trust in him. By scripture, we get to know him. Then we also have spent two weeks, we're going to spend two weeks looking at by Christ alone, for he is alone the savior of the world. And then our final week, we'll probably touch on in some way, shape, or form, glory be to God alone. And so that's where we're going for the next several weeks, talking about foundations. This week we look at by Scripture alone, and we'll talk about what that means and, and some practical applications for what that means for our life. And so I'd like to invite you to look with me, if you happen to have that in your worship folder, uh, the Scriptures that are printed for you. I invite you to look at the inside back cover. I know... Oftentimes, I'll invite you to take out your, your uh, mobile device if you happen to have that. Follow along with that. But I want to highlight uh, these words from Isaiah chapter 40. These words. A voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All people are like grass, and all their faithfulness is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are like grass. The grass withers, the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. As we take a look at this, what God's word means to us, first and foremost, I want to just start out by highlighting that God's word is eternal. And you and I know that life in this world, I love this word, I learned it, in French class, life in this world is ephemeral. It comes, it goes. Like a plant sprouts up, and then eventually it's gone. Uh, life in this world is not permanent. And so God's word, God wants to give us something eternal today. And the main scripture I'm going to talk about today is from 2 Timothy chapter 3. And so if you happen to want to simply follow along in the inside back cover of your worship folder, or if, if at this time, I know a few of you love taking out your mobile devices, uh, not to play solitaire or anything like that. I'm watching you. You know, we got cameras in the back. We can see. We know who's doing that. Uh, but if you wish to follow along, BibleGateway.com or Bible.com or whatever app you use for the Bible, we want to look at Scripture today and what it means that we say, by Scripture alone, God reveals himself. And so, what about this week's theme? Scripture alone. What do we mean by that? You know, Scripture is sufficient for us. It's all that we need. It is all sufficient to reveal to us everything that God wants us to know about him. We know that in his word. Some people will say the Bible contains the word of God. But sometimes people hedge when they say that. They mean, well, it's got some and it's got other things and it's got the word of God too. 
But I want to say this. The Bible is the Word of God that God's given us. He has bound us to His Word so that we might know Him. And this is the thing that I find fascinating, that our God reveals Himself to us in His Word. He wants us to know what He's like. Our God wants to be in a relationship with us. He wants us to know Him. Now, our God, he already knows us. He knows everything about us, the good, the bad, and the ugly. He knows. And yet, more than anything, our God wants us to know him. And so he's given us the Holy Scriptures, his revelation, so that we might see him, learn of him, come to know what his character is like, come to know what his love is like, come to know, above all, what he has done for us through sending his son, Jesus. So as we look at God's word and we say scripture alone, we're highlighting that God's word is alone, supposed to be the thing that guides our lives and directs us so that we might live as the people of God. And it alone, more than anything else, nothing else in the world except scripture and those who retell the story of scripture could connect us with God and the story of his son, Jesus Christ, and what Jesus has done for us. And so God's word here from 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14, and then going on. But as for you, the apostle Paul writes to this young pastor, Timothy, continue in what you have learned and become convinced of because you know those from whom you have learned it. And you know how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. That's the purpose of God's word, to reveal his character, his deeds, his love, his power to us. He wants us to know him. Secondly, though, how do we get to say, well, this, this is the word of God. The scriptures are God's word for us. Well, the source of this word of God is God in his spirit giving his word to those who wrote it down that they would put it down for us for generation to generation to generation. God used several different authors to put down what he desired. He used the style that they had to put it down. Some were great in telling stories. Others were great with their grammar and just flowery language. Others, they sounded like they just came right off a fishing boat. But their words spoke right to where people often are. God used several authors with their gifts, their talents, and abilities and he used them and gave them his word in such a way that his word simply flowed through them. God's word puts it this way. You know who you've learned this from, verse 15, and how from infancy you know the scriptures which are able to make you wise to salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Verse 16, all scripture is God-breathed. All scripture is God-breathed. Now in the Old Testament, we see when God breathes, it brings life. After God created Adam, he breathed his breath into Adam's nostrils, and Adam became a living being. There are scriptures that talk about bones coming together, and even though those bones came together in this prophecy or this picture of what God is going to do, the people weren't alive until God breathed on them, until they received his spirit. All scripture is God-breathed. God breathed into those writers, in a sense, the words that he wanted them to put down. And as they wrote those words, as they were moved by God to put those words down, those words are words that convey life, the life that God gives through his son, Jesus Christ. In another scripture, another place, it talks about God giving his word and that prophets we're speaking from God as they were moved along, carried along by the Holy Spirit. And so the origin of what we have for God's word is God himself. He gives us his word. 
He's provided it. And these words then are his. Thirdly, though, the scriptures are useful. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Something that's useful. You know, why is it sometimes that the things that are good for us, we don't want anything to do with? Have you ever seen that? You ever, ever noticed that? You know, I eat broccoli only because I know I ought to. Uh, and probably the way I make broccoli something appealing to me is I throw tons of butter, maybe even some salt on it. I'm sure that if there were a physician in this room, a cardiologist, they'd say, you're just negating all those benefits, aren't you? Yeah. Sometimes we don't want all of what's good for us. And at other times, there are things that aren't good for us we're kind of drawn to. I mean, anybody like a red meat diet? That's just a, a human example how sometimes we keep the good things at arm's length. But if God's word is useful, why would we keep it at arm's length? Isn't that something that if we know it's going to give us life, it's going to bring us peace, it's going to assure us of God's forgiveness and his love no matter what type of day we've had, no matter what we slipped and said or did, wouldn't that be something that we'd love to devour? God's given us his word to be useful, to be useful in correcting, teaching, rebuking, training in righteousness training in righteousness. He wants his word to permeate our lives. His word is useful in connecting us with Jesus. His word is useful in conveying God's gifts of forgiveness, of his peace, of his joy. Well, I could stop there. That would be three things that you could say about God's word. That it's something that God has given us as a gift to reveal himself. Something that he's given us so that not only would we know him, but we'd have this life and salvation that he brings. These come from him, these words. They're sacred in that sense. And they're useful. But I really want to ask, what's the point? And here's the point, getting to the point here. You see, God's word is useful for something. And I think so often in our world today, if you've been a church person all your life, you've probably spent some time in Bible studies, learning God's word, maybe reading a devotional. But a lot of times what goes in here doesn't get necessarily down to here. And even if it goes from here to here, it doesn't necessarily go to here. You got what I'm saying? So if God's word is going to be truly useful, of course it's going to build us up as his people. It's going to build us up as corporately his people as he speaks to us. But it's also going to build up people for God in his mission. It will be something that drives us to do God's work to make an impact on this world. But even more than that, to be able to help people to know the one who is spoken of in this word, Jesus Christ. See, I haven't read the end of what it says here in 2 Timothy chapter 4. God's word, all scripture is God-breathed, useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. God desires to equip us to do his work, his things. In another place in scripture, it talks about how it's by grace that we've been saved through faith. This is not of ourselves. And that we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Well, if you want to be prepared, if you want to be thoroughly equipped to do the work of God, 
you have to be scripture ready. How's that? Well, God's word prepares us to do his work. How does it do that? Well, for one thing, as we hear his voice, it helps us to dial in when we hear his voice, when we hear him in his still small voice leading us, guiding us by his spirit. It will always ring true with what he's put in his word. And the more familiar we are with what he says in his word, the more in tune we're going to be for what God is saying at any time or moment. That makes sense, right? We need to be scripture ready. We need to have our faith in tune as God's word works in our lives and helps us to align with Jesus Christ, who he is and what he has done. He prepares us then so that when God does speak and say, here's what I have for you to do, that our hearts are ready so that we can move. We need to be scripture ready for that to happen. We need to be scripture ready because when God says, I desire for you to do this work of mine in this world so that lives are changed, if we begin to work in this world doing the things of God, we are going to experience some form of opposition. Being scripture ready means being spiritually ready. In fact, it it says it right here in 2 Timothy. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. But that's not a point where you lose hope. That's a point where you realize that our God has all the power. He has the upper hand. And as he guides us and uses us, he's going to be at work guarding us and keeping us. So what? What does this mean for us? And here's the final thing I want to look at. What might God desire to equip us for? What might God desire to equip us for? What mission does God have set apart for you? We should always be praying about that. Because when God has redeemed us, made us his children, he's put us into this this place with all of these troubles and challenges, but he's blessed us such that we are the children of God, the representatives of Christ, and wherever we go, we bring his peace, his love, and his power. We carry Christ with us. God's word tells us that. I think, too, I'm thinking here, as God's people here at Prince of Peace, what is it that God has prepared for us? What has he prepared for? for us to be doing to make a difference in our world. And how is he equipping us? Are you scripture ready? You know, I've been thinking this week, all week long, you know, all the different things going on in our world. I was at a meeting downtown on Wednesday, down at the Orange County Public Schools home office. And there were some high-level people at that meeting. It just happened to be there. It wasn't I don't know that they think of me as a very high-level person coming there. But it's for faith-based initiatives. And the purpose is so that the faith community is connected with the school community so that when there's opportunity, the faith community can respond to those opportunities. One thing that they were talking about there is they were talking about some things that churches had done. Some people were reporting out what they had done with Hurricane Irma. And, you know, my focus this past week has not been on Hurricane Irma. It was significant in the state of Florida, but my focus has been on Hurricane Maria, probably like some of you. You know, we've got one person on staff who still has not heard from family in Puerto Rico yet. And, uh, you know, it took till Thursday for most everyone else on staff to have heard about the devastation. To hear, it's so hard to get word out that I'm okay. And so someone on Thursday or Wednesday heard from their mom, I'm okay. We're going to be okay. It's tough, but it's going to be okay. Well, you know, at that meeting I was referring to on Wednesday, they were talking a little bit. And, and someone, the, the head of communications for the Orange County Public Schools, was getting ready to go to another meeting. I just pulled him aside and I said, what are they saying that the impact is going to be here from Hurricane Maria? 
from people leaving the island with no infrastructure, how many people might be coming to Central Florida? And he said, you know, our best guess right now in government is that 100,000 people are going to come to Central Florida from Puerto Rico. 100,000 people. I think about this church where we're at. And then he went on to say, probably our best guess is from five to 8,000 new students will be added to the public schools in Central Florida. And I thought to myself, you know, we were t- talking on sta- in staff, how do we respond to Puerto Rico? And already the thought was emerging that maybe our response is as much as anything a local response. Because waves of people will be coming here. And, you know, it struck me how many places of worship today are talking about the opportunity to serve people in Christ's name who may be coming from Port? How many churches are talking about this subject today? 10? Maybe 20? And I just can't escape thinking about how can we respond? Because I think God has made us unique here at Prince of Peace. Oh, yeah, you guys look in the mirror, you're unique. But we're unique. Is this multicultural church where we love and serve one another from all different backgrounds, but also we understand a great deal about our community right where we're planted? You know, we're kind of ground zero here along Goldenrod and Hunter's Creek. That's ground zero for a lot of where a lot of people are going to land when they land with family or friends, when they come from Puerto Rico. They're coming with nothing. They've left everything after everything was wiped out. What would it take to let them know that Jesus has been thinking about you all through the storm and he's been getting people here ready to receive you with his open arms and love when you come here? We're uniquely positioned to be able to do something about that. Pastor Borges is trying to get a team of people together to be thinking on a high level. What would it take? What would it be? And how would we partner with already agencies like Title I in our public schools where we know some people who are involved, we could find out where can we make the most impact to be God's people in this place at this time. And there's no telling how this will transform the community You know, after Katrina, 250,000 people went to Houston. About 15% of them are still there. So it may be that we have the way that God's given us if we are scripture ready and intentional and strategic that we might be able to impact generations with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, but that kind of excites me. It takes me beyond just saying, here's some facts about God's word. But God's word comes to us to equip us so that we will be ready when that time comes. And so we pray that our God, who has placed us here to be the heart, the hands, the feet of Jesus, and given us this foundation in his word, would be at work in us so that we are ready when he calls us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.